right. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Well, everyone, we have some really good news today. This is a, a great day for New York City. It's a great day for our municipal workforce. Very proud to announce uh, that we have come to an agreement uh, with DC 37 AFSCME uh, that will uh, ensure that the people who work for our city and do such important work every day for New Yorkers will have a fair contract over the term of 44 months, a contract that respects our workforce and their needs while also recognizing the needs of our taxpayers and the need for fiscal stability for the long run. When ratified, this contract will secure uh, the foreseeable future for almost 100,000 city employees who are part of DC 37 AFSCME. And I will also detail in a moment some very substantial health care savings that were achieved in this process uh, through the Municipal Labor Council uh, that has uh, great ramifications for the future of the city. Another great example of real cooperation between labor and management for the good of all. I want to say at the outset, you'll, you'll hear from Henry Garrido and from Bob Lynn in just a moment. But I want to, uh, at the outset, thank everyone. Henry, you and your team from the DC 37 and your leadership, everyone worked very hard, and this has been going on for many months, in an extraordinarily constructive way, productive, thoughtful manner from the beginning. And, I want, and we looked at a lot of issues, and I thought there was a, a tremendous spirit, can-do spirit throughout. So thank you to your whole team. Uh, thank you, of course, uh, to Bob Lynn and his whole team at the Office of Labor Relations. Special thank you to First Deputy Commissioner at OLR, Renee Campion. To everyone at OMB, uh, thank you to our Director Melanie Hartzog and First Deputy Director Ken Godner and the whole team at OMB. Special honorable mention to Dean Foulihan, our First Deputy Mayor, put a lot of effort into this as well. This took, uh, again, a lot of work over many, many weeks, but I'm very, very pleased with the outcome. Now, this is our second agreement uh, of this administration with DC 37. And it is evidence, as I noted, of the power of respect and cooperation in labor relations. Uh, there's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be disagreements. But as with the first time around, uh, the most fundamental, most basic uh, reality running through all these negotiations was one of mutual respect. And it made a huge difference. I remind everyone, when this administration came to office, there are literally zero city employees under contract, zero local unions that had a contract. By the end of the first term, we had virtually every single city worker under contract. And uh, that uh, proven approach is now being applied again in the second term. And we're off to a very strong start now. I want to say about the people who work for this city and who are members of DC 37, and I've really had an extraordinary experience over many years in public service to get to know the people who work for this city. And I have an appreciation for all of them, but a special love and connection to some, including uh, the school crossing guards who used to watch out for Dante and Chiara, who are really crucial uh, public safety leaders in this city the folks who work in our hospitals, in our clinics, the folks who uh, keep our beaches safe, the uh, folks who help make sure our roads are paved, you name it. DC 37 is pretty much into everything. And uh, if you look at New York City today in a time of really extraordinary success and prosperity, then say thank you to DC 37 and say thank you to the 100,000 employees of this city who are members of DC 37. This city couldn't succeed without you. Uh, I can also say, and it's an honest truth, members of DC 37 don't always get the public credit they deserve. And I will endeavor every chance I get to say thank you and give that credit. 
but they are getting a fair contract they deserve. And uh, I think we all agree actions speak louder than words. Right. So this, by actions, we, we are resolving a number of important issues in this contract, and we've really listened to the leadership of DC 37 in terms of things that are important to the members. Again, this is a 44-month agreement, almost four years. Brings a lot of stability uh, to New York City government. Uh, one of the things that we all know is when we have labor contracts, it allows us to make a lot of other decisions. It certainly clarifies our budget picture first and foremost. And it allows uh, tremendous security and stability in our relationship with our workforce. It's good in every sense. The workers feel it humanly, personally, for their families. But everyone feels uh, in common cause when we achieve this kind of unity and uh, common purpose. Uh, under this contract, DC 37 members will get a 2% raise on day one of the contract. Again, this is pending ratification. 2.25% for the second year and 3% for the third year. Total cost of this contract for DC 37 through fiscal 21 is $1 billion approximately. But the net new cost is $307 million over the 44-month term. And I want to explain that when I say net new cost. I mean that is when you take the $1 billion and you subtract the health care savings that have been agreed to for that time frame and the amount of money that was in the labor reserve in the budget that was just passed that was already accounted for. When you take those two pieces, compensating impact they make, the actual new cost over the 44 months is $307 million. Now, to the second uh, major announcement today, and I just want to put it against an important backdrop. We look around the country, we've seen very troubling trends at the state level and at the local level, at the county level. We see a number of jurisdictions that literally are teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, this has grown in recent years. Why? Because of pension costs that have gotten out of control and health care costs that have out, gotten out of control. Uh, all over the country, the problems have grown without, in many cases, real solutions being offered. Uh, we know there are challenges always with pension costs. Those are controlled uh, by Albany. But when it comes to health care costs, uh, over these last four plus years, I want to give a lot of credit to our municipal workforce and our leadership of our uh, municipal unions. There's been an absolute clear understanding, which has been absent in many other places, that we are all in this together. And that solving this problem is in the interest of the union members and the city as a whole. It's been outstanding. It's been extraordinary. And it's something I, I hope uh, all of our friends in the media will note. Uh, the spirit of cooperation and the responsibility that municipal labor has taken to help us find solutions. Because this is how we protect the fiscal health in New York City for the long run. This is how we ensure that we can have the size of workforce we need. Uh, part of why we're succeeding right now as a city is we have an ample public workforce. That no longer is possible if other costs get out of hand. There's an enlightened attitude here to control those costs in, in the smart ways that we have found that also allows us to have the kind of government we need for our people. So uh, it bears noting that um, that national trend has been very troubling. And honestly, uh, for a long time, for decades in this city, this city did not make any serious progress on health care savings. Very proud of what we achieved in the first set of contracts and what we achieved with the MLC originally. That's been every single year we've been adding health care savings. But now we will be adding more. Again, the backdrop was what we first achieved, a $3.4 billion health care savings plan in the first term with an agreement to have $1.3 billion in savings every year thereafter. Uh, what we are announcing today, and I want to thank the Municipal Labor Committee for their vote earlier today, overwhelming vote in favor of this plan additional health care savings. There will be $200 million in savings in fiscal 19, $300 million in fiscal 20, and $600 million for every year, fiscal 21, and every year thereafter. When you put these together, starting in fiscal 21, the combined impact will be $1.9 billion in health care savings every year, continuing 
from that point on. And working together, we've agreed on a mechanism to seek additional reforms and additional savings. There will be a health care savings committee established with uh, management and labor representation that will look to find additional structural reforms over the coming years. And those achievements will be based on gain sharing. So whatever savings are found will be split 50-50, 50% -50, 50 uh, savings to the city and 50% return to the workforce. One last uh, very important point, a third uh, piece of news. Um, as part of this agreement, we resolved an outstanding issue that was very important, and it follows on the announcement last week uh, with the UFT related to paid parental leave. Every union has different needs. Every union uh, looks for different outcomes. In this case, DC 37 has decided to take advantage of the state's paid family leave program. And this will formalize that decision because it was subject to collective bargaining under state law. Uh, when ratified, this means that when you combine uh, the members of DC 37, the members of UFT, and the previous uh, managerial employees who had been afforded paid parental leave by the city, uh, that uh, in the next few months, uh, we'll reach a point where 220,000 New York City employees, which is more than half of our city workforce of 380,000, uh, will either have paid family leave or paid parental leave. So it's a big step forward for locking those policies in place for our workforce. We're going to welcome all other unions to come forward so we can work with each of them on a solution that works for their workforce. And we hope to uh, rapidly come to agreement with a number of other unions and keep building on this progress. So uh, before I say a few quick summary words in Spanish, I'd say you know, the theme of this second term is to make this the fairest big city in America. Uh, DC 37 employees for a long time did not get their fair share. I think with the last contract and this one, we've taken a major step forward really recognized how crucial these employees are to our city and made sure that they're getting the support they need and they have answered in kind in the name of fairness by helping us achieve the savings that will protect the ability of New York City to serve its people for years and years to come. A few words in Spanish. Trabajamos con DC 37 para crear un nuevo y justo contrato para 100,000 servidores públicos. También hemos logrado importantes ahorros para los contribuyentes. Contribuyentes. Oh. contribuyentes. Thank you. <laughs> Lifeline. <laughs> that one killed me. <laughs> en pagos por servicios médicos de los trabajadores. Hemos establecido una nueva era de negociación respetuosa con los trabajadores y hoy está dando frutos para beneficio de todos los neoyorquinos. With that, I want to turn to the executive director of DC 37 asked me, and I want to say uh, I have now worked for years with Henry Garrido. Uh, uh, this is an extraordinary leader, one of the most uh, substantive and well-informed leaders I've ever worked with. Uh, passionate in defense of his employees, uh, willing to roll up his sleeves and work and work and work until the job is done. And uh, Henry, your approach has been tough and it's been smart, but it's always been fair. And uh, I, I want to express my appreciation for the, the way you've handled these negotiations and what it means for the people of this city. Ladies and gentlemen, Executive Director of DC 37, Henry Garrido. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your kind words and for uh, being here today. I think uh, today is a historic moment for our union. First, let me start by thanking uh, our negotiating team made of the presidents and the leaders that are here. You cannot do this by yourself. It certainly take a tremendous amount of work. I want to particularly thank 
the part of my negotiating team, David Paskin and Mickey Green, for the great work that they did. Please. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank Commissioner Lane and certainly uh, Dean Fullerhan, Renee Campion, and, and uh, the the team uh, Ken that, that uh, Gardner that, that worked on the city side for approaching this from the position of respect. Look, I see this as a major paradigm shift. We we have come here in terms of negotiations every time where the city approaches city workers from a point of view of concessionary bargain. They come in and they demand and we do the same. And the truth is you can hardly a achieve any of those, uh, uh, um, you know, solve big problems like that if you don't have mutual respect. So we took a position that unlike on the, with the previous administration, we would start from that point of view. And we were going to tackle some of the most difficult things that are part of our municipal contracts. Uh, and that involved having some honest discussions about health. Uh, I wanna take a moment to thank also the leaders of the Municipal Labor Committee, Harry Nespoli and Michael Mulgrew, who together with us work on the health savings that made it possible for us to begin to uh, achieve um, a productivity savings on health, you know, following the trend of last time. Um, Unlike last time, I think one of the, the things that we looked at in terms of this contract was not just wages, because as the mayor announced, that's important, especially for the people we represent, which are the lowest paid city workers, but also from the perspective of what's good for the city, what's good for the taxpayers, and what's good for the sustainability of the city of New York. So in addition to the wages that the mayor announced, we, for instance, took a very strong look at education and professional development. Uh, I see it as one of the trustees of the pensions that the mayor uh, mentioned before. And in our analysis, is more than 100,000 city workers will be leaving city government soon. We need the best trained, better, best educated city workforce in the world. This contract sets aside um, historic amounts of funding for education and professional development for the people we represent so that we can train the next generation, the workforce, so we can look at recruitment and retention, so we can look at hard to recruit titles, and look at um, how we can train uh, the city workforce to prepare to deliver the best services for uh, the taxpayers in the city. This contract looks at e equities, f fixing inequities that existed with professional titles, whereas pattern bargaining usually doesn't get to do that. Uh, and it looks at other things for individual units and hard to recruit titles and professional titles that we had before. Um, it is a responsible contract. We looked at very um, uh, um, long-term view of the city's workforce. It is a fair contract and I have to say, as people across this nation are looking at uh, potentially a Janus decision or where the Supreme Court um, is poised to give a blow to a lot of unions, particularly in the public sector, this contract takes a different approach. It, it approaches the employees from a matter of respect, and it begins to look at what are the, what are the solutions that we can in, in case the Supreme Court you know, uh, does render that decision. How do we handle work-related complaints? So how do we handle the, the whole concept of collective bargaining, which has a tremendous value for government, and you know, it's just being vilified all over the place. So, I want to thank the mayor, I want to thank this team, certainly thank my team for the work, and more importantly, I want to thank the members of DC 37 for the work um, and for the dedication and the tenaciousness to deliver to the city the best service that the New Yorkers deserve. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Henry. As I turn to Bob Lynn, I want to note that uh, I think I've got my facts straight. It was over 30 years ago that uh, Bob Lynn uh, first served this city, and he did it with great distinction uh, in a challenging time in the city's history. Uh, and one of the very best things that happened to this administration was the day that Bob Lynn agreed to come back in the public service in 2014. And he did an outstanding job uh, with all of the contracts in our first term, 
Uh, this gets us off to a very strong start for second term. A lot of work to be done up ahead, but this is uh, an extraordinary start. And Bob, I've, uh, I've watched with tremendous admiration as you uh, ply your craft, which uh, takes extraordinary uh, subtlety and uh, understanding of so many different elements. But what I have seen in the end is you always find a way to get people together. And uh, none of this would have been possible without your extraordinary efforts and your great team. So I want to give you a, a very warm congratulations today. Well done, uh -huh. Bob Lynn. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Henry. Uh, let me say before I present my remarks that all the during the years, there's been a lot of years I've been involved in labor negotiations. Um, it used to be said when people would announce a settlement, um, you could tell it was a fair settlement because both sides were unhappy. Hmm. And it always struck me what a terribly depressed conclusion that was to collective bargaining. <laughs> because a really good settlement is when both sides are happy. And I think that we achieved a settlement here where both sides walk away from the table feeling that they've been respected, they've been treated fairly, uh, and they have a settlement that works. Um, and we achieved that. So I am very proud to have negotiated this, uh, this very important labor agreement um, with Henry Garrido and DC 37. Uh, I believe the contract will form the economic framework for the city's labor negotiations for this current round of collective bargaining. I also want to personally thank Henry Garrido and his team, uh, David Paskin, the uh, Director of Research and Negotiations, Mickey Green, the Associate Director of Research and Negotiations. They are tough, they are honest, um, they are deeply committed to the workers they represent, and they are deeply committed to New York City. Um, I also want to thank the city negotiating team. I have uh, been up here on a number of times and I've really not taken the time, which I should have, to thank Renee Campion, um, my tireless, wise, tireless. extraordinary first deputy. Tireless. <laughs> I'd like to thank my friend and colleague and tough uh, sort of reactor to what I do, Ken Godner. <laughs> uh, the, Brilliant First Deputy Budget Director. Uh, I want to thank Claire Levitt, my innovative deputy uh, for uh, benefit cost, health benefit cost contain containment. Uh, I want to thank Steve Banks, who has been an amazing young lawyer and negotiator working on this and writing up our agreements. I want to thank Regina Fuchs for her constant work and analysis. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Kerry Gow, who works for uh, for Ken, a terrific labor cost analysis from Owen Big. Third, I want to specifically thank Dean Foulihan, uh, an incredible first deputy mayor um, who has been a constant supporter, uh, calls me 40 times a day to make sure that we're making progress. He is a superb strategist um, and a good friend, and I, I thank you, Dean. Uh, and fourth, I want to thank the mayor uh, for putting, having the trust in me. I want to thank you, Mayor, for having a trust in me to make you your, your chief labor negotiator. Uh, over the last four and a half years, we've negotiated a number of contracts, um, responsible agreements, and amazingly, with DC 37, we now will have covered 11 years of collective bargaining mm. together. 2010, all of those retroactive years to 2021. You had, you had some work to make up for for other people. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just have a, like, a few words about the negotiations. We spent almost a year uh, seeking to find agreement that would balance the union interests of a fair, reasonable wage increases at a time of tightening labor markets um, and increasing cost of living um, with the city's interests that we had of reaching uh, an agreement that was affordable um, and responsible and fair. We had mutual interests to deal with paid family leave, um, to work to deal with the escalating health care costs and figure out solutions that work for both labor and management. Um, and we wanted to work together to blunt the impact of the expected Supreme Court Janus decision. Um, that would likely preclude automatic union dues deduction, deductions. Uh, I believe in this year we have accomplished all of these objectives, uh, and I am proud to have been part of these negotiations. Thank you all. Well done.
Okay, we are now going to open up to media questions on uh, all of the different elements of the labor announcements today. Erin. Uh, a couple <clears throat> questions. You mentioned that this contains family leave through the state's family leave policy. Mm -hmm. Can you just expand on a little bit? How does that work in practice, and how is it different from uh, what you did with U of T, for instance? I'll let the experts speak. I'll just frame it as the non-expert. So again, every union has a different sense of what's right for its members. Um, the uh, state law allowed for public employees to have that benefit, but it had to be negotiated. Uh, so this has formalized that process of uh, making sure that this is implemented for DC 37 members. Henry. Yeah, so uh, we congratulate on the UFT and the agreement they did. They did a pay parental leave uh, for our union membership and based on our demographics. It was more important for us to the pay family leave as supposed to pay parental leave because we have an older workforce and because we have more family members and our negotiating committee felt that it would be stronger if we get a pay family leave. So under the current agreement, we were going to opt in into the state uh, law and the city would have to be one of a, a, a file an application. Uh, and then there's administrative processes that, that would take place. Uh, and so the effective date of the paid family leave under the state will be January 1st of 2019 because it takes administrative process to do so. Uh, and so as opposed to do it through the health insurance or the union's benefit trust fund, uh, because of the pay for rental leave, we felt it was better to do it through the state. So does that mean does the city pay the salaries still then, or is it a partial salary? What, what, is, what are the actual benefits? This is, we negotiated two separate agreements we said should be part of collect, collective bargaining, and both are fully paid for uh, out of the uh, contract. Uh, with PPL, for the UFT, we dealt with it through an extension of the contract. Um, with this benefit, there is an employee contribution, employee payroll deduction, um, that pays for the benefit. Um, in both instances, we negotiated something that worked for the unions, uh, worked for the people they represented, uh, and did not have an additional cost impact on the city. So I want to emphasize that. And we said it from literally day one when we announced the 20,000 managerial employees. This is not a budget item, meaning every time the savings to fund it have to be found in uh, the collective bargaining process. Um, so I want people, I think there's an assumption out there which is wrong that somehow this is like a budget line and cost the taxpayers. That's not true. In each and every case, it is funded through the collective bargaining process, just like any other uh, benefit is achieved. Okay, so just how much is the payroll deduction and how many weeks do they get at what level of pay? So that's either something I can do now or we can follow up. The payroll deduction is 0.126% in 2019. Um, there are 10 weeks of leave in 2019, and there's a specific caps in terms of salary amount that's provided. Uh, but this is the state plan, and we follow the provisions of the state plan. Right. And, and, and we'll take questions now, of course, but any, uh, if there's a, a lot of detail needed, the team will get together with anyone who needs that. David? I two uh, related question. So you said 307 million, I think, was the new uh, net new cost. Correct. Gross new cost. I, I said it. One billion is the total cost through 21 fiscal 21, including tw fiscal 21. But the reason we get to the net is we already had a labor reserve going out years, and this now factors in new health care savings. So when you take those two offsetting factors, the labor reserve and healthcare savings, the net new cost is 307 million over the 44 month term of the contract. When you say new cost, you're not, I mean, they are- new, Money that will have to be put into the budget new that's not existing in the budget now. But that's over what's already being paid to employees of DC 37? Let me try again, let me try again. Okay, we have a budget that was just passed by the council. In that budget, there was a labor reserve, but we didn't have a labor deal yet. So it was theoretical and it was a placeholder. We obviously did not have additional health care savings either. By and you'll, you'll jump in, but by agreeing to this contract, what we're saying is over the 44 month term, which takes us up through fiscal 21, the total cost is 1 billion. Take away that which you already banked with the labor reserve 
Take away now also the fact you're getting additional health care savings. Now you have $307 million you've got to find over the 44 months. That's not currently in the budget and will have to be funded in the budget. So um, when we talk about the health care savings, the, the way it was described by um, the Municipal Labor Committee in their um, release earlier was that uh, you know, the agreement includes increased reliance on services in freestanding health centers. Yes. So was this, were there lots of people from uh, unions that were going to hospitals when they should have been going to doctors? So, so may, really if I may, uh, so maybe uh, I can put some context into it. The biggest growth in our health insurance cost is the hospitalization side. So under the previous deal, we kept primary care uh, at a, a relatively a single digits. You now process the hospitals, uh, particularly some of the very uh, local hospitals like NYU and uh, Columbia Presbyterian, we're increasing the cost tremendously, double digits. And they were also taking the position, some of the things that are normally done through ambulatory care, um, they did it as an inpatient. What this deal does, it recognizes changes into the healthcare trend, and it he, and he, he now sets up centers of excellence for, um, for uh, 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 certain procedures like cancer and orthopedic in order to save money by changing the trend from an inpatient to an outpatient setting. And in doing so, you're saving sometimes 10 times the amount in the procedures by changing that process. But if I'm a worker, am I now required to go to one of these places right out of the hospital? Is that how that works? Presumably they would have it. So, so yes, so there's these centers of excellence will be, if you're a worker now and you're going to these, we are, we, you will be required to use one of these centers of excellence. Now these centers of excellence, are actually um, run by reputable institutions like Sloan Catering Cancer Center was one of the ones that we looked at. So it's not a matter of quality, right? And when you look at the, at the healthcare measurements, these centers have a far uh, more improved quality of the liver services, and you can do that more effectively and cheaper. Um, let me note, just again, I'll be the, the layman who, Henry, Henry knows too much. Let me, let me, make, it, <laughs> let me make it very simple. Um, to your very good question, we still, as a whole society, we all, I mean, I can say, you know, we all came up thinking, oh, you go to the hospital for essentially everything. Uh, what's happened over the last few decades is a recognition that that's not a sustainable uh, model. But because that recognition exists doesn't mean that habits have changed sufficiently. Uh, this is a very systematic way to get people to go to an outpatient setting where that can be just as effective rather than a more costly setting. That's one of the crucial elements of the healthcare savings. I want Bob to speak to the capping yes. of costs in terms of insurance and put in perspective what was versus what is now under this agreement. So let me say, we followed up on the approach of the last contract where the parties agreed labor and management to specific health savings targets compared to the projections of healthcare costs that we had in our budget and we achieved every one of those savings. We initially said that there was gonna be $300 million of savings in the first year, growing to six, 500 million or 600 million, and then a billion, and then 1.3 billion recurring. We followed up that same concept this year, where we said that we are going to hit financial savings versus the average trend factor that's expected, the average healthcare cost increase of 6.5%. That's generally what people have predicted, that healthcare costs would go up over the next several years. And we said, we want to save 200 million in this coming fiscal year, 300 million in the next year, and 600 in the third year recurring. The major way of dealing with that, as opposed to that 6.5% trend factor, we agreed that healthcare costs would be capped for the city at 3.5% next year and 3% the year after. Growth, so that'd be the, that would be the maximum growth. Yes, the maximum growth. So that's half the expected growth. That saves a substantial portion uh, of the amount that we're looking for. And these programs are how those savings will be achieved, how the trend will be kept um, at, those, at those levels. But those levels are guaranteed. And if we don't hit these savings, there is, again, a contractual agreement that we would go to arbitration and the arbitrator could award alternatives. But just as last time, we never needed to go to the arbitrator. We threw agreement across the table, found savings. We fully expect the same thing will happen this time. So I want to emphasize the tangibility of that, of uh, a specific agreement of all parties 
to cap the growth of those expenses at 3.5% initially and then 3%. Uh, to me, that's a game changer. That's a very big step for this city. And again, when we juxtapose it against what we've seen around the country, uh, the kind of thing that if a number of other places had done a long time ago, they would not be in the trouble they're in now. And this was done in a very cooperative fashion. Yeah. It's going to adversely affect H&H &H because some sort of patient base is not going to hospitals in the city? No, I'm, I'll start and people can jump in and these, both these gentlemen spent a lot of time on the question of H&H &H as well. And Dean has and Mel has as well. H&H um, &H is in a process of change because it needs to be in a process of change. I think uh, what Stan Bresnoff did and now what uh, Mitch Katz is doing is very important and absolutely the right direction. Uh, we do not want undue hospitalizations. There are some things you really need to be hospitalized for. That's, you should get that. But the whole world is changing to uh, more focus on outpatient procedures, and then even more so to a focus on primary and preventative care. And that's absolutely the model that H&H &H is embracing. We have to make sure H&H &H continues to improve its work, so people, of course, will want to go there. We have to make sure that more and more people get insurance, which is why we fought to protect the Affordable Care Act and, and why we've worked to en, uh, enroll so many more New Yorkers. But I would argue that this is very consistent with the same approach we're taking in our public uh, hospitals and clinics. Who else? Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Garrido mentioned the, the Janice uh, court case. Just wondering how that factored in. Are, are there kind of protections against that? And if so, how, how do you expect that to work legally? I'll turn to Bob, but say, look, we, you never know with the Supreme Court, but I think a lot of us have felt the handwriting is on the wall and that the decision likely to come down is one that is going to be very unfair to working people and uh, is going to undermine the role of organized labor in our society. And I get back to the basics. Organized labor brought us the middle class in this country and fair uh, wages, fair benefits, fair working conditions. All that's now going to be under threat. We don't take that lightly. We don't think we're bystanders. We want to actively help compensate for that decision if it goes the wrong way. So we've tried to get ahead of that uh, and come up with ways to address it. Bob. Henry, you want to uh, say anything? Yeah, I, I think one of the problems that we have with this Janus case is that it undermines the, the, the whole collective bargaining process. When you set up a two-tier work workforce where you have members and non-members and the non-members can get certain benefits that the members can and vice versa, it sets up an, an impossibility when it comes to the workplace. We want to make sure that with the passage of the state leg legislation that was effective April 1st and the potential court on the Janus case, that we come up with contractual language that allows for a process that if the Supreme Court rules that non-members are not required to pay dues or not required to be part of the union, that we still have protections for them and still protections for the union at the same time. And there are, we came up with mutually agreeable language that would allow to set up a fair process to deal with members and non-members alike. And that's important for the union, important for the workers, and for the non-union uh, non members as well. Uh, I think we don't know what the Supreme Court is going to be, so it's hard to come up with language that would insulate us from everything else. But I think that people underestimate the chaos that could be created by, by a Supreme Court decision that essentially turns non-member as independent agents of themselves. Can you imagine thousands of workers coming to the city and saying, I'm not a union member, now I want to negotiate my own deal, or I want to negotiate my own seniority, my own principle. It would be absolute chaos. And I think that's one of the consideration before the Supreme Court, now hoping that the wisdom there prevails. But if not, the wisdom at this table, we're hoping that it has prevailed by coming up with language that sets up parameters for members and non-members alike. Can I give... Uh Three examples. We, we believe in collective bargaining in the city. We believe it makes sense. We believe it works. We believe it's better for everybody to have collective bargaining. So we will report to DC 37 new hires, uh, and we will let them know who are, who's, who's uh, come to the workforce. We won't hide it. We will let them know who, who's, who's been hired. 
Um, we allow the we'll allow DC 37 to meet with newly covered employees and to give them time. It's both under the state law and under our agreement um, that we now have to do that. Uh, we will notify the union of promotions and reclassifications so that they are able to track members and to be able to uh, um, to uh, to talk with those members uh, um, during the process. So we believe in collective bargaining. We believe the union should have access um, to the workers they represent, um, and we agreed in the contract to uh, help assist with that. Excellent. Okay. Can I just, I'm Please. sorry, address David. There was something, the question regarding Health and Hospital Corporation, I believe must be addressed. A part of this deal, there's an absolute commitment to change the way healthcare delivery system is done in the city prospectively. And I think to that extent, this is not about cutting HSC. I think it's the opposite. We found in the data that city workers have very low utilization of city hospitals. And we think that could change. If, if HAC were to make some changes, the Health and Hospital Corporation were to make substantive changes that would allow for city workers to have access to those services, especially the ones that do particularly well, um, that this would be a mechanism to do that. And, and I think that if we approach it from that perspective, it will be a win for the workers, it will be win for the city, and for the people we represent in the hospitals. We represent the lion's share of people in the Health and Hospital Corporation, and we want to make sure that they're insured. So that's not what that deal was. It's the opposite. I think that if we do what we set out to do, it, it will give city hospitals a better opportunity to compete for the business that we believe some of those hospitals have a monopoly on. Of what they've been having in the private healthcare market, which is that you move away from inpatient hospitals. I mean, this administration and others have not wanted to close down hospitals. Is this, are we moving that? No, I think it's a very different. I understand the question, but I want to emphasize: a hospital facility can do a lot of different things, <clears throat> and the notion that you want to rationalize who stays overnight or stays multiple days uh, for there are some procedures absolutely you need that for. Uh, versus who does not need that? Um, are we doing the things to keep people from getting sick to begin with, right? I mean, this is, these are the different elements of this discussion. Focus on preventive care, primary care, when someone needs a procedure. If it can be outpatient, do it outpatient. If they need to go into hospital, go into hospital. But we have a lot of professionals and a lot of facilities. We also have a whole lot of need. <clears throat> we need to have uh, different elements of health and hospitals that specialize. For example, some of our facilities have a lot of uh, capacity in mental health. That is an area of growing need, in fact, where clearly there has not been enough uh, mental health services provided for years. That's a growth area, and it's good that we have facilities and talent that can address that. And you'll see other examples like that. So no, we, we need all of our, um, our health and hospital campuses, and we're gonna use them in what I would argue is a more modern and efficient fashion uh, that makes sense for the needs of today. Let me see if there's anything else on these agreements. Looking around one lot of time with our friends in the media going once, twice. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.